Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We will wait. Good morning. For... Good morning. Good morning. Why won't it let me change my name? Hmm. Yeah, you usually have to do that in settings. Looks like we've got about eight, nine of us here total. Let's give a minute or two since we're still a minute or so early and then we'll go ahead and start. Okay, everyone is unmuted. Welcome to Tuesday. Well, I guess today's Thursday. Jeez. Good morning, Shana. Good morning. How are you all? Good. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm excited to get this going today because we've got a lot to cover. Can you all see the screen? Just want to verify. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. So, da, da, da. so let's go ahead and just dive on in. For the moment, I have you all unmuted, uh, and I will mute you all for a few minutes, and, I'll, and you can unmute yourself if you have a question in the meantime. Uh, quite, I'll just start off with any questions so far. I mean, really, basically, the first session is really covering mostly history of what's going on but i do think that's important to understand where that came from so again you know we know where we're going right Shana, i can barely hear you really can you hear me a little better now yeah we can hear you perfectly here at georgia you can hear me fine okay yeah, I can hear you. okay so Let's jump in. I'm again. Let me know if you have any questions, comments up front. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and dive on in. Nothing. All right. Well, sweet. We'll hop on in. Okay. Um, let's talk about, and this is a tool identify. And again, you know, when I talk about tools and we talked yesterday about if you're going to certify yellow belt, you need to work basically five tools, green belt, 15 tools. And that can sound intimidating, but once you really understand what these different tools are, it's very, very simple. Um, none of this is rocket science. Let's be honest. Uh, so one of the tools, in Lean Six Sigma, this, and this tool, and these tools again, some of them come from Lean, some of them come from Six Sigma. This 
this particular tool comes from the lean side of things. It's identifying eight ways. Now, I've seen other things out there. I've seen some organizations say there's seven ways. I've seen some say there's nine. The general consensus is there's eight. If you want to identify something differently and identify it differently, that's fine. Uh, but generally, that what they are defects, again, uh, we all remember what a defect is, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah? All right. So, so we've got defects. Then, of course, overproduction. And overproduction is just like what it says there. It's pr making more than what's needed. And this is not just in cases of, of, uh, a manufacturing setting think of it in a service setting for what you for what most of you are doing right you're not manufacturing anything you're producing certain things uh, for instance if you're a recruiter you're not going to recruit 40 people because the client needs 10. you may recruit a few extra but you're not going to go crazy right it's that type of a thing that's wasting your time and their time and of course the employee's time then waiting of course Anytime someone's waiting, you know, that old adage, time is money, that's where that comes from. Non-utilized talent, that's there, that's all, not using people to the, to the best of their abilities and the, with their skills. Transportation, and transportation, you know, they, they put a truck logo there, but it's not just physical transportation like trucks. It's also, think of you, you sending, emailing a file, uh, someone, uh, storing extra files, sending emails, things like that. So it's virtual transportation and it's physically walking from place to place. It could be on a production floor, it could be in a service facility, again, all of those kinds of things. So whenever we talk about things, you need to think about physical thing and virtual thing and what would a virtual thing look like in your world. Then inventory is, and what what would inventory be in your case? It could be the physical product that maybe a client has, but it could be people, right? If you're in a staffing organization, it could be people. It could be files. It could be documents. It could be a lot of things. Motion is, of course, we think about motion in terms of repetitive motion, excess walking, but it's a lot of things. It's also, again, that repetitive thing, too many emails, things along those lines. And then, of course, over-processing, which is doing more than, than what's needed. And generally, again, that, that falls back to having, producing what the client or the customer and who, defining who your customer is, and we'll talk about that here in a moment as well, defining who your customer is and producing what they need as opposed to more than they need. Think of that in terms of, again, most of you are familiar with the recruiting, recruiting, recruiting arena. If you're recruiting people, right, you're going to need certain information, but do you need to provide what color their eyes, someone's eyes are? No, that's over, that's over, overkill. So I am going to go back to unmute, unmuting you all so we can go to this next slide. But because I want y'all to, again, pe pencil, paper, laptop, whatever that may be, whatever that may look like for you. I'd like you to identify waste, what waste looks like in your world. You said what waste looks like in our world? Yes. So based on all of those different things that I, that I gave you, you know, those eight ways, and let me flip it back to that slide. What does waste look like in your world? So can you identify, I'm not saying, can you identify one from each of those categories? Could you do that yet right now? Yes. Um, one example is for extra processing. Uh, let's say what we used to do, but we already fixed this issue. I just want to put it out there. Um, we used to process every single person before offering them a job. 
And then once they're done with the processing, we offer them the job and then they don't take it. They're like, oh, I don't want it. I'm not interested. So we wasted a drug test. We wasted, you know, time and everything on a person that is not interested in the jobs that we have available. So that was like extra waste of time. And right. And, that, and that's a perfect example. Does anyone else have an example? No, I I can I can I can give you one. Um, in the past, uh, when there would be an incident, an act, so an accident occurs, and someone needs to send me, uh, let me notify me, I would get a, I would get an incident report emailed to me, but it also had to go in TempWorks. Now PII situation uh, completely aside can you see where there's over processing there mm -hmm. doing something twice instead of basically you would be doing something twice which you didn't need to do first of all you don't need to do anything you shouldn't have to do anything twice and then of course there's the pii thing um i think uh one that i can point out is like defects um our employees sometimes are defects in a nice way because sometimes we, we don't explain properly what the job is um, and as recruiters we just you know want to get employees out to work and get our customers taken care of and then our employees go out to work and they walk off or they don't come back because their expectation wasn't what our expectation of the job was right right that's perfect so let's die I mean I we went really high level over these, right? And I kind of expect you off the top of your heads to, all right, we'll dive in, give me examples of all of this. Let's dive into each one of these individually and talk about these and what these mean. And I'm not, don't, ex and again, this whole slide deck, you'll get the whole thing at the end. Uh, so don't worry about that. Um, you'll have all of this. So again, a defect is, and I'm not going to sit and read the whole the whole slide to you, but it's it's basically scrap. It's something you don't need. Uh, something that didn't work. Think about it. I mean, it's easy. Again, it's super easy to think of in a manufacturing term. You're making something and it didn't work out the way it's supposed to. But in service, sometimes it's more difficult. People have a harder time wrapping their brain around what a defect is in service in service industries. Service, if you're a bank, uh, something doesn't get deposited to someone's account in a timely manner or in the correct manner, it gets put in the wrong account, the amount is wrong, all of those different things are defects. In your recruiting business, uh, you forget to check a box that needs to be checked, forget to get someone's ID, all of those kinds of things are defects, right? Not getting someone social when you're onboarding a, a new employee, that could be, that could be an issue. Uh, all of those kinds of things are, are potentially defects. As well as, to Maria's point, um, if you're sending Sending someone out for a position, you've recruited someone for a position, and you send someone out, and you've got a job where, you know, for whatever reason, that person really ultimately is not a good fit. That is a defect. Not the person is, isn't a defect. We're not putting that, that's not about a reflection of the person. It's the process. There's a defect in the process. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So, da, da, da. and notice that bottom line though, I would like to point that out where it says some experts estimate defects have a 10 times negative impact on a company. In other words, think, think about the cost of problem, those problems, those defects. Um, sometimes it's extra work. Sometimes it's just something as simple as I've done something twice that I didn't need to do. Well, quite frankly, that's time and uh, again, I sound like a broken record, time is money, right? So it, it, it could be time, it could be having to rework, it could be extremely expensive because, I don't know, the wrong person was set out and they have an accident. Something went out um, in the case of, there could be liability issues, you know, thinking in banking industry, uh, somebody's information got shared and, you know, there's a huge liability and risk there. So, so there's, cost to all of these defects and and again by reducing identify being able to identify defects and 
either eliminate them completely or put processes and controls in place for your processes, you're going to reduce your costs and you're going to, you're going to reduce your risk and ideally re increase your safety. Okay. Overproduction's next. And that's making too much. That's really just doing too much. And again, in a using an example of a recruiting world, that's, uh, that would be, yeah, like I said before, recruiting 40 people when you need 10. When you know that you're never, even if, you would just never do that, I would assume, right? Right. Uh, or in banking, or think about some place where you need to stamp something. I've I worked in a situation uh, a few years back where there was a lady who received documents every day, and she needed. She came to me and said, "I need to order a new stamp, like just you know a rubber stamp, you know, and with that you stick in ink and stamp the paper." And I said, "What does what does the stamp say?" The, the stamp said, "Received." So she was wanting to pay, pay money to buy a stamp that said received. And she wasn't very happy because I told her no. And I said, you can initial the corner of the paper and that indicates you've received it just as much as buying a stamp and sitting and spending time making sure you've gone through and stamp every piece of paper. And so think again, think about what overproduction would look like in your, in your world. And again, that takes time and it takes effort. And so it costs money and wastes money. Then of course, waiting, waiting is just that, right? Delays to process steps, having delays, having to wait. Um, have any of you ever been in a situation where you're, wor you're working on something, but you can't move on to the next step because you're waiting for someone to finish something and get, some get back to you with a piece of information or something, something along those lines? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by you waiting, again, by you waiting, it's wasting your time. And again, I, sound, I know I sound like a broken record, time is money. Underutilized talent really can be a lot of different things. So operators not being asked for their input, right? I guarantee every single person on this, on this, in this meeting has talents that they've not been asked, that have not been tapped into for work. I mean, raise your hand if, if they've tapped into every single one of your talents that you've been, you have nothing that you could possibly give extra that they haven't been able, able to. Your organizational skills, your people skills, being able to negotiate, all these different things. You're doing all these things, right? Right. So having people, and, and quite frankly, think about it in terms of some of the employees that we place, um, some of the employees that we, we place, uh, they, uh, I'm gonna mute you guys because somebody's got some feedback going on. All right, some of the employees that we place, are uh, quite frankly, they're underutilized. How many people have we placed in jobs, warehouse jobs, that quite frankly, they've got degrees? How many of you have degrees? I do. How many of you have certifications that you're not using? Right? That's all underutilized talent. And that's where, when you're working through processes, and this is one thing I've said, if I haven't said it, I should, should say more often, which is question everything. I don't mean tell everyone, you know, this is dumb and this is why are we doing this? I'm not saying this, but ask why are we doing this the way we're doing it? Is there a better way to do something? Get into that project manager mindset of let's pick through things apart. Let's tear it apart. Let's look at the processes. Are we really using everyone to their best capabilities that we could be using? And that's whether it's, whether it's employees, whether it's internal, what, whether it's with a client, whether, what, whatever it is with a vendor, whatever, is everyone being used to their absolute most 
uh, the the most they're capable of, and then you know you're working at optimum, right? Um, because I guarantee you've got folks that either report to you or their employees that that report to you or you yourself. You can offer more, and then part of that too is not just don't sit and wait for a manager to say, "Hey, can you do something?" If you can do something that you're not that you see there's a need for, offer yourself up raise your hand say hey you know I see we need whatever and I know how to do that I've got experience doing that or or maybe it could, your response could even be I don't have experience doing that but geez it's something I've always really wanted to learn can I give it a try and have those conversations get into it and again it expands things out all right so next one transportation Again, transportation, I specifically threw a letter on there, uh, a letter uh, picture on there, just because, I, again, I want you to think of this as, I want you to think of email. I want you to think of certainly um, a production floor is easy way to think about it. Trucks going from point A to point B is easy an easy way to think about it. But again, think about emails. Are you sending something different places? Um, an example that I can give is, uh, an example I can give is, several years ago I was asked to go sit with a group uh, because they knew they had some pro issues, but they really, you know, the director that they all reported to wasn't really sure where the issues were but you know hey Shauna can you go sit and identify so I sat and watched what they were doing and doing what they were doing one woman was showing me what she did she would get documents in she would process them do what she needed to do and then she would email them to her boss he would approve it and send it back when I sat with the boss and said when you approve what she does when you approve what she does, what do you do? And he goes, oh, I just send an automatic reply approved. I don't even look at them. And I said, well, why? He goes, because she's so good and she's so efficient. Um, I trust that she's good at what she does. But I still like to see that, you know, and I said, well, then why even bother? And he goes, well, I still like to see and I, like, and I need to be able to report to my boss that there's a control in place. So my recommendation was, look, you've got someone who's very, very accurate at what they do, but you still want a control in place. Rather than looking at, every, well, looking or at least pretending to look right at every single document that she's producing, why not do a monthly audit or a quarterly audit or whatever time frame you deem appropriate? And by doing that, you're saving her tons of time. We, you know, thinking about does, how long does it take to send an email? Not that long. But how many does it take, how much time does it take to send 100 emails an hour? You know, when this one was spending a full business day processing all of this stuff to the point they were thinking they were going to have to hire a, a half FTE to fill in for the group, their group because they were so busy. By switching from him basically just blindly approving every document with without really reviewing to a real audit process it, it, that accomplished two things it saved time and it also actually caught a few errors and so again do what makes sense all right so next is inventory how many marbles do you have in your uh inventory right and again i say this over and over physical and virtual right uh in some cases inventory is uh can go bad right if you're in a situation where you've got a, a manufacturer or someone who stores you know food products or medical medical grade products that stuff has a has a timeline you can't just store something for three years necessarily whereas if you're just storing you know cardboard boxes that that's probably going to last a lot longer although realistically even something like that could de degrade over time so it's making sure you've got again it kind of goes back to that one slide that we had yesterday if you 
if you may remember that just in time producing really just what you need and again that goes with virtual because you're not think of inventory in terms of again in the recruiting world you're not going to recruit a hundred people when you need ten and have people just out standing out there waiting um because certainly you're going to end up with some irate people who are not going to want to come back the next time right so that's what inventory is there let's move on to motion and again motion's an important important one because it's a lot of different things it is certainly, you know, think of thinking again in the in a manufacturing situation where people are moving their hands back and forth or they're reaching and pulling and stretching. That that kind of repetitive motion that we can get into, we definitely want to reduce that as much as possible. Think about you in terms of th even in terms of ergonomics, the way you sit at your desk, is your motion correct? That because that can create issues. Think of it in terms of motion in how you're, how you're twisting, how you're moving. Think of it ergonomically as you sit. Think about, again, and I've had people ask me, and feel free, I've got you all muted. Feel free to unmute yourself if, you have any, if any of you have questions. Um, the difference between motion and transportation. Transportation is physically moving something, physically or virtually moving something from one point or another. Motion is the people part of it, right? So, and again, make sure that whatever motion you, ha you that you're doing, the people doing in your process or are doing adds value to what you're doing. Uh, again, if I've seen things, I've toured a facility, gosh, it's been six months probably now, where they were having people carry these bucket of product and carry these, what are they, you know, those great big buckets, what are they, like 50 gallon buckets, I guess it's probably not 50, like five gallon buckets, I guess they are, but you know the big buckets, right? Anyway, buckets, and they happen to walk with them full of, full of liquid up a little staircase like three it was just three or four steps up to a platform and dump it into an area so again extra motion that's transportation and motion in that case because they're moving something like that but then also the additional motion and they were having to lift it up and reach over and they were having a lot of shoulder problems um, they switched that and built a small platform to do that and uh, siphoning s s system and reduced having to do both of those things and eliminated injuries and the process went quicker. So again, what whatever that may be. All right, so extra processing is kind of a little bit like that bug on, on there. I mean, while that's super schmancy fancy, some people may say that's really cool and I'll pay extra for something like that. A lot of people will not, a lot of people will not. Uh, Cause does ultimately, does all, all those extra colors and patterns add, add value to it? No. No. Um, if, if you're, per, if you're, creating a, even just creating a document if you throw a pattern on it flowers pictures whatever that may be is does that add value to the content of your document no no right so it's it's about doing what you need to do and certainly i'm not saying don't make everything be as sparse as possible and plain and, and don't put anything on there i'm not saying that but do what adds value to you, you know, throw your company that's Logo. how i feel about that's how I feel about resumes. When people put their picture or some funky color, they print it out like on funky pastels. Yeah. Uh, it drives I, me crazy. I'll be honest, when I see resumes like that, that it instantly tells me that person hasn't worked in a professional world very much, so they've identified themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's 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 about doing what's needed, and certainly you want it to be professional. And obviously, if you're in marketing, of course, marketing people want everything is super fancy and oh, let's do this. And but it would be like if you're a ma going into the manufacturing arena, if you're producing a label, is a label with five colors going to sell the product more than a, a label with four colors? Probably not, right? 
So it's, it's, it's about all of those different kinds of things. So now that we've talked about all of those and thinking again about all those different kinds of ways, right? Thinking about those, think, I would like you all to think again about your world and, and let's try again. Can you, can you think about in your world different kinds of waste? And I'll flip this back so you can see this. Different kinds of waste that happen or occur in your world. Nothing. Okay. You know, I know where most of y'all work. I, I can definitely identify some ways. <laughs> okay. No ways. Uh, for me, Carlos, um, I will say probably uh, the waiting. And right. When I say waiting, it would be uh, waiting on uh, some team members, you know, to come uh, through on a task right. that needs to be completed in a timely manner before I can report back to my manager or someone else. Right. Well, right. And probably all of you at one point or another have had to wait for me, right? You have to wait for me. Hey, if somebody's asked me whatever, let me ask Shauna, right? You have to wait me for me, or I may have to wait for you, vice versa, either way. Um, but that's just part part of it, right? So the most we can do to make things self-serve as possible, right? Which is part of the reason why we've got the risk and safety library. Um, when I first started, I had someone ask someone to do an incident report. And they said, well, I'm waiting for Kelly to get back so I can get a form. I'm like, oh, we're not going to do that anymore um, because we, we shouldn't have to wait for something that's pretty basic. We're not asking for information. We're just asking for a blank document, something like that, right? So anytime we can put stuff like that in place, that eliminates that waiting and, and it also eliminates overproduction so that one group may be doing, you know, maybe one group is working in incident and actually when I first started I saw that where one group would do an incident report and they would do something and they would add extra things to it and it would be you know 20 pages long other groups were doing some that was maybe four or five and then everybody in the middle is doing what eight or nine um, so that's the most the most that you can standardize things uh, helps and then of course it eliminates waiting eliminates overproduction and all of those kinds of things make sense Thank you. yes all right any questions no no oh, sweet all right well, let's skip that one so let's uh, again back into the whole lean six sigma thing um, so we talked about lean we talked about six sigma so now, but this course is about Lean Six Sigma. So again, Six Sigma is about reducing variability, being very accurate, standardizing things, being, uh, reducing variation, standardizing your processes, and also eliminating waste, adding value. Lean is about improving processes of reducing waste, reducing com complexity, all of those things. So then, of course, like you see how this graphic shows, where those two come together, really, they come together, and I really consider Lean Six Sigma the best of both worlds. And what's nice is with Lean Six Sigma is Six Sigma has a ton of tools. Lean has a ton of tools. With Lean Six Sigma, you can use them all or you can pick the ones that work best for you. You don't have to get really specific. What's nice as well is, I'll be honest, is Six Sigma is very heavily uh, focused on statistics and numbers and not everybody's comfort, comfortable there. Now, for those of you who are, who are that's great. But, if, you know, and use them. I mean, I had one gentleman of, who works for one of our clients who went through this class couple of times ago and I went and sat down with him and he did this big fancy regression analysis I mean it's brought a tear to my eye I mean don't see those very often anymore and did all these charts and all these graphs and all this stuff do you have to do those no absolutely not 
can you do them? Of course. Um, but again, some of these tools, just identifying waste is a tool. Um, sitting and having a brainstorming session is a tool. These are, I mean, this stuff is really basic and I say this over and over again, it's not rocket science. Uh, Y'all got this, so one thing I'm very happy about. So um, again, basically bottom line, that's why I like that bottom, that bottom line there, Lean Six Sigma improves quality, cost, and accountability. That's basically, that's basically what it boils down to, right? All right, let's talk about belts and what the different belts are, because I've thrown out the term quite a bit of yellow belt, green belt, all of that, all of that great stuff. But, um, but th let's talk about belts. In the general roles, and I talked about this in that little intro, intro class, there's starts with a white belt, which quite frankly was created it's probably been 10 years or so ago, but it was basically a white belt is, but you go <laughs> attending that little intro session is basically the equivalent of a white belt. I mean, a white belt is just, I know the basics. I don't really work projects, but I know the basics. I understand the terms. And that's usually, uh, most of the time, that's usually really high level executives that don't get into it they usually get a white belt just so they're familiar enough to be able to say they understand the concepts of things like Sigma. Then for, then for uh, next step is yellow belt, which again, this class you can certify with a yellow belt or a green belt. Yellow belt is someone who really understands the basics. And if you'll notice the graphic on the, on the side of this, doesn't have a white belt listed on there in that thing because white, white belts, I mean, technically it's a quote unquote belt, but again, they're not really working projects. Yellow belt's really the heart and soul of it. That's where you're get, getting in and working on projects. You're doing things and you're understanding the basics of tools. You can, you can function your way around there. Then green belt is the next step where you're diving in, you're definitely working projects, you're using a lot more tools and there's a deeper understanding. You're working with more people and usually the projects are larger. Not necessarily because I've seen, and I'll be honest, there is no standard across the board for a yellow belt project is this, a black belt project is this and vice versa. And I can use the example of Everywhere I've been, except for my first role in, with six, learning, doing Six Sigma, everywhere I've ever been, a green belt has been savings of about thirty to fifty thousand dollars. My first project I mentioned before already had a total savings of three million dollars, and I still certified with green belt. And even though technically that's uh, definitely black belt level project that's just what they were certifying at they were very very aggressive with their goals and it was that was an atmosphere of there is no such thing as low-hanging fruit you're going to yank yank up trees and start shaking so it, it varies but as we determine them and for our purposes yellow belt is ten thousand at least ten thousand in savings green belt is at least thirty thousand um, which is very realistic and quite frankly, very doable for all of you. Um, then the next step from the green belt is a black belt. And black belts are people who really dive in, they're working projects, definitely working several projects a year, as well as coaching, training, and doing other things. And then master black belts, I mentioned that before, master black belts is, don't see a ton of them a lot, although um, I actually saw one come up the other day. Um, master black belts are people who design uh, project management offices. They, they're basically usually leading project management offices, things of that nature. And that's usually, at this point, it's usually really large corporations that have that. Not a lot of people um, want to invest in a master black belt because again, that's kind of Obi-Wan Kenobi status. And then the last one on there is not a belt level, but it's a champion. And I want you to understand the role of a champion and what a champion is. 
every single one of you will have should have a champion for your project and a champion is someone who they're not working anything for your project necessarily but there's someone who's going to help you open doors and break down barriers now um, for some for you folks in Atlanta that may be Carlos uh, it, it may be me, it could be Kyle, it could be Kelly, it could, it could be Chris, it could be a lot of different people, right? Uh, but it's usually someone of higher, not necessarily that you report to, it could actually it could even be a client, right? Depending on what your, what your project is. So one thing I would like all of you to think about is who is your champion? And that's not necessarily that you're going to walk up to this person and say, Congratulations, here's your badge, you're my champion. But you're going to say, I would like you to champion my project. I want you to, basically, they're going to be the ones who help you break things down. Geez, I'm getting resistance from this particular group to get answers so I can get the right information for something. A champion is the person who's going to be able to help, help, help you open those doors and get that information. <laughs> Make sense? Yes. All right. And get this thing to change. All right, so Yellow Belt talked about this already, but I want to talk about it specifically for you all. Again, you're going to, this is developing basic knowledge of Lean Six Sigma. You're going to be able to use it, you're going to be able to understand the concepts, and you're going to be able to use, use the tools and identify what tools to use. Part of the, the, point of certifying is not just that hey i've certified i've got a certificate but it's also you're identifying that and you're identifying and proving that you've got you've reached a certain ability right you're, you're capable of, of uh, you've reached a certain level that's what that's about and the expectation is that if you certify in a yellow belt project that you're not going to just say, cool, I've done that and stick it on the shelf. You've gained that knowledge and ideally you'll use it again. Well, it may or may not be a formal project, but you'll at least have those abilities. And that's what the point of being able to certify it is. Then green belt is, of course, that's for folks who are willing to dig in and, and do more. And if you get to the point that you, you certify in a green belt, it's definitely not required, but I highly recommend you work at least one project a year after you certify. Um, even, and it's not that you're recertifying, it's just basically you're using those muscles again. I myself, I've, I mentioned before, I've certified several times over the years. Most recently was last December. Um, I didn't have to recertify, but I did that partly so that people that I work with know that I'm current in my skills. Um, again, I can go back to my example and I think I used it with you guys of, it's like taking, you know, me taking Spanish classes from a teacher that learned Spanish 40 years before. I mean, she's pretty darn rusty, right? You gotta, you know, you gotta use these tools to, to do them. And quite frankly, even today, um, I busted out a couple of these tools just to, to do some basic things to check myself on some things I was working to make sure I'm on track. Sometimes if I'm working some, something bigger, if I'm working with, you know, leadership team and giving them some data and all these things, I don't want to walk through the door and say, I feel like this is what we should do because it feels like this and it feels like that. Feelings are very subjective, but if I walk in with hard data, look, I ran, I ran a what analysis and I ran my FMEA and I'm throwing out names of tools that we haven't talked about yet, but I talk about specific things and I give them very specific numbers. That's much more powerful and quite frankly, a much stronger argument than me walking in and going, oh, yeah, it feels like we probably just shouldn't do that. All right. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So I ask why is, how is this relevant to you? All of this improving processes, um, hopefully y'all see a glaring relevance to you all, but I'll ask, do you see a relevance to you all, to you in your role and quite frankly, in your professional career, not just your current role, but your professional career. Do you see how Lean Six Sigma, how getting actually certifying in a yellow or green belt is relevant to you? 
Yes. Yes, I think it's going to help all of us know better what position we are currently in. Uh, I, I see already how it's going to help me personally uh, very well. Right. And, and, and I'll be very honest with you all. When, when I sit down and talk with the leadership team about doing these, these courses, which, by the way, we're doing a separate one for them as well, um, my t my comment to them all is my motivation in pushing to be able to do this Lean Six Sigma course internally here for you all is very uh, selfish. I want you all functioning at a higher level. I want you guys picking things apart and looking for ways to improve things. Because by doing that, you're reducing our risk and increasing our safety. And that, 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 that would be really, really helpful for me personally. So this slide, again, this should seem pretty basic and I know it sounds a little bit like a broken record, but I, I repeat myself to make sure it really sticks. Lean again is focused on reducing waste and streamlining processes. Six Sigma is on focused on eliminating defects, certainly problem solving, but it's also on um, reducing variability, right? And so, and again, I'll ask a question, why would reducing variability be important? Anybody? To reduce unexpected outcomes. And what does that mean? Mm, to reduce waste. Oh, you're so good. Um, right, so think of it in terms of if you variability what does variability mean say if you're onboarding a client or an employee or anything like that one of them you do really well and you get everything done nine out of ten you do right um one's one's different one of them nine eight or something like eight employees you drug test two you don't could that be a problem yeah. there's variability right right uh, or in the case of a manufacturing setting, variability, seven out of 10 of things you produce are good, but three are not. If you walk into a restaurant, if, if it's, you walk, it's your favorite restaurant you go to all the time, you go in, say, I don't know, once a month. If you go in one, one time and the food's not good, are you gonna go back? No. Well, you might. If it's your favorite restaurant, you might say, oh, they're just having a bad day, right? But if it's the first time you ever walk through the door and that's the time that they're having their off day, you're probably never going to go back for sure, right? Yeah. So, very, again, variability. That's why you want consistent in whatever you're producing because whoever your customer is and again we'll we, we'll talk later about who will use your customer because customer isn't just someone buying something right it could be someone like if i'm asking you for a document i'm your customer if you're asking me for a document you're my uh i you're i'm your customer or you're my customer other way around sorry so it varies, right? It's not just purchasing something, it's who you're producing something for. And they may not be the end thing. Like if I'm doing something and ultimately it's, it's for the benefit of a client, that's great. At the end, the client's the big customer, but I've got a lot of the other customers in between. Okay. Now, hopefully uh, y'all remember yesterday, since it's not that long ago, we talked about Taiichi Ono. Mr. Ono from Toyota, who really pushed and pushed lean and developed the Ono circle is a tool and this is a tool. Um, and you don't get the benefit of seeing Shauna standing in front of you and all my waving around and all this. So, but the Ono circle, what he would do, and, and honestly, this guy was pretty hardcore actually. He would take a piece of chalk out on a production floor and draw a circle and then he'd take some like another engineer or a management, someone in management, whatever, hand them a clipboard and stand them in the circle and say stand here and watch for defects. Watch for you know all those different forms of waste. Watch for waste, watch for defects, watch for all of those things. And then he'd walk off and leave them there. 
and he and he would tell him you're there until I come back and he'd leave him there sometimes a couple hours and he'd come back a couple hours later come back and say okay what did you find and they'd say oh well I found this or this or maybe not enough and you know there are stories and I don't know if they're true but there are stories that uh when there are people that uh said oh I didn't really see much or everything looks like it's okay then his response was you didn't stay there long enough and he would leave them there longer now I'm not suggesting, and now you can do the uh, a version of the Ono Circle in a service environment too. You don't have to be just in a production environment. I've done it in the banking environment, where you know we're they're not moving things around. It's a cubicle farm. But you do that by just basically it's by just shadowing someone is a version of the Ono Circle where you sit and really stay more than just. And I use this as the equivalent of, I mean, how many of you done a site review, right? And when you do a site review, you just walk through a building, right? Or walk through a facility. And when you do that, you see this, you see this, you see this. And it's, to me, that's the equivalent of like taking a picture. Okay, there's a snapshot in time here, a snapshot in time here, a snapshot in time here. The UNO circle is the difference between a picture and a video. Because you get there and for a, you stay there for a longer period of time, and really it should be at least thirty minutes. Um, and obviously you're out of the way; you're not, you know, in path. Whether you're in a cubicle sec area type of area or in a production area, you're not in a place where you're going to run down, right? But you're really there observing. And of course, what happens when you're there initially, and you're there, and people know you're there observing? Everyone sits up a little bit straighter, stands up a little straighter. They're, they they pay more attention because, oh, Shauna's there, Carlos is there, Maria's there, whoever, right? They know they're being watched. So, and so everyone's a little bit careful. But over time, people go back to their habits because you're there. And quite frankly, you start to blend in with the furniture a little bit, right? And then you really start to see stuff. And that's why you really minimum 30 minutes is there. And I can use the example of we have a production manager, well, the HR manager, I think is actually his type, current title now, from one of our clients here in Salt Lake attend this session two, I think two sessions ago, attend this co course two sessions ago. And this is gentleman from Utah, folks are definitely familiar uh, from Rocky Mountain Pies. They produce pies, not, not a clever name. First, when I do the in-person course, I f usually finish up the day, the first day with the Ono Circle, and we talked about this. And he went off and went back to work, and he came back the next day super excited. He's like, Shauna, I went and tried that Ono Circle. I didn't really think it would work, but I thought I'd give it a try. And he stood in their production area and sat and observed that one of their machines that did the finishing off on a pie on the pies that really was just doing like the last little squiggly decorative whipped cream whatever on top of a pie every seventh pie was was being funky and was just splitching funny so it just wasn't pretty and every seventh pie that had that splitchy thing on it the operator at that machine and this is a big big machine the operator of that machine would take that pie and throw it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. There was nothing wrong with it other than the decorative piece was wrong with it, right? It would still taste just as good as the other ones, but they couldn't sell it because the decorative piece wasn't right, right? So it's this really minor thing, but it's a defect. They cannot sell it as is. So every seventh pie, that's 15% of their production was going in the garbage. He went and talked to the machine operator and said, hey, whoa, hey, what's going on? He goes, oh, it's, I've been in this. And the guy's response was, I've been in this machine three years. It's always been like this. Mm -hmm. Three years of that. And he said, wow, really? He goes, well, we mentioned it once before a long time ago. The guy I took over from said, had said, oh, this machine's just, that's just what it does. This is just what we do. That had become part of their process, throwing away 15% of their production. And that being going on, quite frankly, they're not sure how long it's been going on. They, they estimate for four to five years. So four to five years of throwing out 15% of their profits. 
that's millions of dollars. And they estimate it probably was brought up really, really early on. It was German. I was not that big of a deal and it got forgotten about oh, no. and yeah. not taken care of. And it ultimately something that was about a pretty expensive fix to the machine. because it was a really, it's a really old machine. He told me it was like five to $10,000 to fix. So it's an expensive fix, but five to 10,000 versus millions of dollars. That's just kind of a no-brainer, right? Um, and this is something that just happened pretty recently. Um, th and I've seen other examples of that as well. So the Ono oh Circle, I, and I really tend to spend a lot of time on this one because this is a tool and this is really easy. This is really easy to do. It's, you're observing, it's observing and observing for a while. And even if you end up seeing everything is going perfectly well, it's an opportunity to and very rarely, I'll, I'll say that with the caveat that not that often do things go perfectly well. It's an opportunity to really, really sit and observe people, how they are interacting with each other, to observe their process themselves. Is there a better way to do something? Seeing somebody do something once or twice is easy to make presumptions, but really seeing something over and over and again, if it's a virtual process, like in an office setting, I've done the Ono Circle where I've just sat by someone at their desk and said, just talk me through what you do. So I understand what you're doing. Cause I can sit and watch, but I don't know necessarily understand exactly what you're doing. Just talk out loud. Okay, well, I finished this document, now I'm doing this. And then I send it off to this person. So basically it's a version of the Ono Circle in a virtual world. So you can do it virtually and you can do it obviously physically. But again, this is a really powerful tool um, that I really want y'all to get familiar with. Okay, we wrap this up here for y'all. So again, Six Sigma, just talking again about Lean Six Sigma benefits, it decreasing costs and you can, Hopefully, even just the Ono Circle, right, is a great example of how you can decrease costs. There are a lot of different tools like that, though, that you could use to, to do that. And of course, a lot of different reasons why you would decrease the costs, but um, where, however, you're decreasing costs in increasing production. And think about how powerful that is when you're working with the client or you're work, going out for anyone in sales, like you, Carlos, or anyone else who's on the line who works in sales, I know Cindy's on the call. If you walk through the door and, and, and you're walking in with that mindset of, I can already see opportunities to improve and you can mention that to a potential client, how much more likely are you to get that sale? And then again, it's also about increasing efficiency. I have never, ever had anyone tell me they don't want me to save them money and increase efficiencies. I never have. Um, that's just not, not the way it works, right? So I'm going to stop there because we are winding down and I do want to leave a couple minutes. Um, do you, any of you have any questions? No, it's good. Beautiful. So uh, even if you're not working in a specific project, do you see how even a tool like the Ono Circle could be useful for you in, in your role? Yes. 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 Again, stuff standing in the stand, and again, I'm not suggesting you actually physically draw a circle. You just pick a spot and stay there, right? Because most people are not super excited about you drawing circles on their floors mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, uh, this is a great tool because uh, one of the selling points uh, for the clients is that our on-site strategists will be increasing productivity from each uh, employee that we bring in to the floor right and, and I know with all of you you have 326 things you're doing an hour right so it's hard, you think, you want me to stand someplace for 30 minutes and I got 1,200 other things I gotta get done? I promise by spending that 30 minutes, you're going to find problems, you're gonna find defects, right? You're gonna find issues. And quite frankly, you're also gonna increase safety, which happens to be a little near and dear to my heart, right? 
Yeah. So, uh, so all of this stuff is really important. So again, we're just about at time. Do we have any questions, any other questions, comments? I don't have a question or a comment, but later on this morning, can I call you so we can discuss my project? Absolutely. Okay. And again, for all of you, any of you have any questions concerns, whatever deep thoughts, or hey, you just want to talk about process improvement, feel free, you can call me, text, you all have my, my email, you all have my phone number, email me, text me, call me, any of those things, whichever is available, best for you is fine. All right? Thank you. Well, thank you all, and uh, we will always see you all same time tomorrow. Yes, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, team. Thank you.